Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back, and welcome into another episode of the Coast to Coast podcast here on InsideCarolina.com. I am just your host, Joey Powell, but with me as always, the two guys that you are here to hear, Sean Moran, Sherelle McMillan. Gentlemen, how are you? Doing well. Yeah, Sherelle? No complaints. No complaints. Fruit snacks engaged? Done. Are they, are, are, wait, wait, wait. Are they Terry Rozier engaged or are they just fruit snacks? Terry, Terry Rozier engaged. Man, scary Terry went nuts <laughs> last night. We're recording this on Sunday for everybody who's listening and watching out there in the world. And uh, in one of our uh, group chats last night, we were watching Terry Rozier absolutely just eviscerate an entire team in the fourth quarter, which was rather, rather fun to watch. Um, and speaking of fun to watch, we got a lot of stuff to talk about tonight, guys. So, Shout out to everybody uh, who is listening on whatever means you get your podcasts. Uh, shout out to the folks who are viewing on YouTube. We appreciate it. Regardless of how you're taking us in this evening, please take a second rate review. If you have not subscribed, please subscribe. Uh, we appreciate that. It helps when you give us good reviews, helps us get to the top of uh, these podcast algorithms so that uh, when folks search for us, we're closer to the top of the list which means we get more clicks which means we get more ad revenue which means it goes right back into producing a great great content for y'all and as always this is part of the insidecarolina.com podcast network which all the stuff that i see is putting out right now you guys are probably listening to but if you're not make sure you check it all out there's something for everybody and everybody gets something uh as i said earlier i'm joey powell we appreciate you joining us I uh, want to make sure we're shouting out to our friends over at Johnny T-Shirt. They are bringing you this show and all the shows that Inside Carolina puts out. Uh, Johnny T-Shirt, locally owned, alumni operated. Hit them up if you're home gating, watching these games on TV right now. You need some gear, need something just to spice it up a little bit. Take care of them. Uh, they've got all stuff for all sports. Uh, baseball team got off to a good start this past weekend. Uh, a lot of the other sports have been doing really well. Uh, you got a lot of UNC's varsity sports right now are ranked in the top five, which is amazing to see. And basketball is not one of them. So great day to be a Tar Heel. Good time to get your gear from Johnny T-Shirt and JohnnyT-Shirt.com. Hit them up. And as always, Inside Carolina Premium subscribers, get that extra 10 off the top. Yay, yay. Make it happen. Fellas, let's talk some recruiting news before we get rolling. That sound good? Sean, I want to throw it to you first. You have something coming up about uh, Mr. Dontrez Styles. We've talked about him recently coming back from a pretty scary injury uh, and getting back into the groove of things. But you're going to have something coming up this week on InsideCarolina.com about Mr. Styles. What can you tell everybody about it? Yeah, it should come out uh, Monday. Um, and it's similar to what we did with DeMarco Dunn at the end of January, I'm just looking at his most recent game doing some video clips and not just, not just highlights, but kind of showing all, all the shots. So you see the good, the good with the bad, and then just a few, a few takeaways, but I know he had a monster game earlier in the week and then was able to watch his Friday, Friday game. Uh, so I believe this was the last regular season game, which is kind of crazy to say, but it, I guess it is at the end of, end of February. Um, and he, he had uh, 32 points, 11 rebounds in a, uh, in a win. And he did that very efficiently. I think he was around 12 of 17 from the floor. Uh, and, and, you know, kind of kind of mixed it in, hit some threes. He had two threes, um, was attacking off the dribble and hitting a few kind of 12, 15 footers. So, you know, he, he, he did it all. And you can see that in the, in the film clip. And I think, you know, the one thing, Everybody knows how athletic he is, so it was good seeing, you know, just how explosive he is off of two feet, whether that, you know, was, was almost kind of doing what you see Leakey doing a lot of the time is grabbing the, grabbing the rebound and pushing the ball up the court, but at the same time, he was able to utilize uh, athleticism when, when attacking the basket as well, and he looked very comfortable shooting from the mid-range. Uh, he hit an NBA-length three-pointer, but I'd say that, you know, still a little concerned on, on how the shot release looks and how it translates next year. But I think, you know, once again, it'll, he'll be an interesting piece between him, him and Dunn. And I think he will offer some uh, kind of offensive and defensive flexibility with, with how the team looks and how they could potentially use him next year. And what time do you think that'll, that'll hit the, the boards this week? 
Uh, depending on when this comes out, you know, I'd say Monday, Monday morning, Monday afternoon. Awesome. Well, we'll make sure that everybody listening now knows about it and they'll be keen with their eyes to check it out. And I'm sure like all the stuff that you put out for us, it'll be some really, really good insight about his game, where he fits, how he fits, all that good stuff. So we appreciate your, your insight there, man. Um, another recruit we want to talk about, and we've been talking about him as a class of 22 kid, uh, does have an offer from North Carolina, but uh, there's kind of some, some debate about that. Sherelle, won't you let us know about the top six list that just dropped for Mr. Deontay Green? <clears throat> Yeah, so right now he is uh, in the class of 2022. Um, you know, actually, we got his parents to confirm that to us uh, a few weeks back that he planned on staying. However, I think with uh, reclassification, it's always kind of a moving target. So 100% in January might not mean 100% in February, <laughs> um, but I'm, I, I'm sticking with them. I, I believe that's what they want to do. And it's probably going to end up being a matter of which school he chooses, whether or not he decides to reclassify. Obviously, for those who follow North Carolina recruiting that know that uh, I don't think North Carolina has ever had a reclass. They've had a couple people consider it, but it never actually happened at UNC. So uh, the thought is if he goes, ends up committing at North Carolina, uh, that a reclass is very unlikely. Uh, because Bro Williams kind of tells those guys, hey, you know, enjoy your senior year, enjoy high school, get better, and I'll see you in a year. Um, it's ironic because uh, Walker Kessler was in a situation like that two years ago where he was considering a reclass. And one of the things that I actually think helped North Carolina in that recruitment was that uh, Bro Williams basically was like, we don't have an offer for you in, in 2019. And they're like, you don't want this five-star kid in 2019? And um, I think the par his parents were a bit thrown back by it. And I think it gained some respect. They gained some more respect from Roy Williams because of that. So all that to say, um, if he does reclass to 2021, then, you know, that's kind of a telltale sign about what the interest might be in UNC. Uh, but from what we understand, you know, he, he did announce a top six today. It is pretty much the entire ACC <laughs> um, and then Tennessee. So it's, it's top six are Florida State. NC State, Virginia Tech, Wake Forest, Tennessee, and then North Carolina. And basically, you know, what we've heard is that uh, UNC, Tennessee, and NC State seem to be ahead of everyone else. Um, I actually think, I'm pretty sure Tennessee is actually closer than NC State and mm -hmm. UNC. So that's something people don't think about. Asheville to Knoxville is like two and a half hours, and I think it's about the same, maybe three and a half hours from Asheville to, to, Chapel Hill. The, yeah, to the Chapel yeah. Hill and Triangle. Um, so that's something people don't think about with the Western kids in North Carolina, but that's the top six. Um, he had a top 10 and um, I think he was going to have a top five and he made it a top six by adding Virginia Tech because they were not in the top 10 before. Um, but everything we've been hearing basically points to UNC, NC State or Tennessee. Yeah, I'm glad you answered that. I was going to ask what your your fabled list within the list was going to be. So appreciate you jumping ahead on that. Um, Sean, any quick snapshots about Deontay Green's games you want to remind everybody about? I know we've talked about him before, but it's been a little while. Yeah, we've talked about him before. I mean, I think for, for him, his length, uh, his size, his shooting ability, uh, his, his improvement points, you know, once again, you, you feel you say this about almost every big, but getting stronger. Also just his, his quickness slash explosion. Um, and I think, you know, I think, we'll see how things go on the recruiting front. I know that similar to all other North Carolina schools they are getting ready to do the playoffs. I know there's a full few full games. Um, so I definitely want to, after watching styles, he's next up on, on the list in terms of guys, guys to watch. Cause I think the big thing for him is, is he a UNC level recruit or is he an NC state level recruit? And there's a big difference between the two and you don't want to get stuck with NC state style recruit uh, at UNC or at least, you know, minimize those as much as possible. And I think that question is, is still out there right now. And I would add to, um, you know, thinking about what his role projection is, they've talked to him, you know, we always talked about hybrid forward, but they've almost pitched to him a, a hybrid center almost role, which would be, uh, you know, a guy who can play mostly four in, in kind of traditional lineups and then who would be uh, kind of a lone post in a small lineup, quote unquote small, because the kid, he is like six, eight and a half, six, nine. Yeah. Um, so that is the role they're pitching for him. I do think right now um, he is not a player that you would see on the wing. Um, I think, you know, could he be in four years? Maybe. 
uh, Sean's shaking his head no. But could he be maybe? I, I don't know. But right now, that's kind of uh, how they have him pegged. It's kind of a, a hybrid four or five uh, in, in Carolina's offense. Outstanding. And that's, uh, again, that's, that's good context for folks to understand you know, how he may play himself into a uh, UNC system or may not be a, a UNC recruit. And Sean, I'm not going to, I'm not going to acknowledge the shade that you threw there because I don't think it was meant to be shade, but I know where you were going. No, with no it. I mean, I, I think it's, appreciate it. I mean, I think I've said similar things about Wake Forest is that you're, you know, UNC is playing, you know, at, they're, they're recruiting the best of the best that ideally are not going to the G League or one and done. And there, there's a big, big difference between those types of players. And, you know, right now, UNC is hopefully going to be in the tournament, but you can't, you can't continue to get those types of recruits if you want to be playing as a top 10 type, type team. Fair enough. Uh, anything else on the recruiting front, guys? Uh, Kinston starts to take playoffs, I believe, on Tuesday. Uh, those pairings were announced today. And then uh, Green is at a, a private school in Asheville. So they've already started their playoffs, and he had the game-winning tip-in um, against the defending, I think it was 3A champion in that classification, which I think was Concord Academy or used to be Concord First Academy. Uh, so he did that over the weekend. So those two guys are advancing. I'm not sure where Westover is at, um, but they'll start the playoffs as well, uh, I believe, on Tuesday. All right. Appreciate the rundown from you guys. Uh, as always, y'all are always bringing the, the number one info and the, the good stuff here for all of our listeners and viewers. Uh, take a quick second, tell you once again about Johnny T-Shirt. Johnny T-Shirt on Franklin Street, johnnytshirt.com. Hit them up. Going to take a break. Let the national guys uh, run a couple ads, one or two. They'll be right back to talk about what was a fun night for the UNC Tar Heel basketball team in the Smith Center. Hang tight. We'll be right back. Thanks for sticking around. You listen to the Coast to Coast podcast. I'm Joey Powell. With me, as always, the two guys that bring the heat, bring the info, that bring the knowledge, to bring the insight. Sean Moran, Sherelle McMillan. Guys, uh, I started before we, we actually hit record tonight. I was talking with Sean, and I think we knew that this Tar Heel basketball squad could be better. I'm going to speak for myself, and will allow you two both to reply. I did not know they had that in them, that being what we saw uh, in the 99-54 to 54, uh, throttling of Louisville, who was just outside of being a Q1 team. I realize they were coming off of a, a major uh, COVID hiatus, but COVID, COVID uh, easy for me to say. I was just about as good saying that as Louisville was last night playing. Um, <laughs> Louisville coming off of that COVID hiatus might make, you know, might make that game a 20 or 25 point game, but it doesn't change that outcome because the Tar Heels were an absolute buzzsaw. Sean, how'd you feel about seeing that finally come together uh, for this roster of Tar Heels and seeing contribution from so many guys. It was definitely a lot of, a lot of fun to watch. I think, you know, from a fan perspective, what a lot of people have been hoping to see from a Carolina team on, on offense in, tor in terms of getting into the nineties, uh, running the fast break. I think it was kind of a perfect storm of, of UNC playing well mixed with Louisville having the break, uh, kind of just a lack of, inspiration on on their end and you know having you know they did get Williams back for the game but you know that was really his first game back and not really having having any legs but I mean I think you know 10 10 and a half minutes in this was this to me it was shaping up to be one of those games where you know it's tied at 18 and you felt like UNC had a, had opportunities to kind of get out to a lead and establish some dominance already and instead they're missing free throws and it felt like it was shaping up to be one of those games. And all of a sudden Kerwin hits three, Dayron gets a basket, Kerwin hits another three, and then they're just off to the races. And it was fun watching really everybody uh, get to contribute. And I think they were able to enjoy themselves. And, you know, once you, once you get the lead, you can play a little bit freer. And I, you know, I, I know we'll probably touch on Northeastern, but I think is going to that game and being able to schedule that during the week. Uh, once again, that was a game they started out slow, but the talent difference was so vast that there, there, there's a lot more margin for error in that one. But same thing, 
you're able to get out and get some confidence and do some things that you might not normally do in an ACC game. And I think that led into uh, what we saw against Louisville. So overall it was fun and it would have been nice to see a hundred plus points, but getting to 99 in the ACC and having your best offensive and defensive performance right now is still, is still pretty good. Look, man, you guys don't even have Bojangles on the West coast. So don't be coming at me about how you feel bad about not getting a hundred points. Um, I was just hoping, for, hoping for you. <laughs> but that's a, that's a great point about the Northeastern game and how we did get to see the Tar Heels actually put their collective foot on Northeastern's throat during the week. And I think there is something to be said for getting that game in um, because as we've heard this past week, a lot rust accumulates. Sherelle, how did you feel watching that game? I mean, I hate to go straight for feelings, but um, <laughs> as somebody who's been sitting here saying all year, you know, the, I've heard you say many times, they're starting to get it. Things are starting to click but they still need to do X. It seems like last night, except for getting 100 points and ex except for hitting their free throws, everything really kind of clicked. Am I missing something? No, nah, I, I think you're right. And you start to see, especially offensively, uh, I think defensively they've been pretty solid outside of a couple of games for most of the season. But now you're starting to see the offense round into form. That's three of the last five, I think, with 82 or more. Mm -hmm. And that's two of the last five with 90 or more. Mm -hmm. Granted, Duke is an awful defensive team, <laughs> Um, but, you know, they still did it. You have to go out there and do it. So uh, offensively coming around, that, that was great to see. Uh, for me, it was kind of interesting because uh, I, I'm going to get there. You know, I have to go a long way. I have to go in circles to it's get okay. to my point. But, uh, you, you know, you always hear people talk about uh, close, close wins where a team plays bad and they say, Oh, that's the perfect for the coach because that way, right. uh, you know, a 65, 63 win, they still won, but the coach can give them lessons, but it's like, yeah, the kids didn't feel good doing it. So I don't know <laughs> how much that really, really helps. I think a game like yesterday is the perfect thing because yeah, they won, you know, one of the biggest wins in the Roy Williams era, they got that check. Uh, there are some things that were, they did really, really poorly shooting free throws, some turnovers in the second half that Roy Williams can cor correct and show in film. So they don't get too high and mighty check. Uh, they felt good. The offense, you know, ran well, Curran Walton was shooting threes. Everybody contributed check. So basically what happened in the Louisville game was kind of what, no disrespect to Northeastern, I was expecting in a Northeastern game to mm. propel them into the Louisville game, but it's like they kind of did it the opposite way because you would expect them to do what they did on Saturday to a lesser opponent and kind of, you know, reverse the roles. Um, so I, I think it was a good thing. I, I don't think there's any way I, I really can't find as, as someone who um, follows them and covers them, I, I can't find a particularly huge negative yes free throws are bad but they've been bad for most of the season so it wasn't like it was anything new well they were uh, bad and then they had a couple of games where they were up around 70 percent. yeah and last yeah. night it was back in the toilet right right so um i just think it's perfect you you get a huge win you get a ton of confidence you get everybody contributing and roy williams still has some things that he can pull out and say uh, uh you haven't arrived yet uh, you still need to do this better and you still need to do this better and i think in the post game press conference what he said was really funny because he said yeah they only had 11 turnovers and he feels like he remembers all of them which is mm -hmm. good because when you have 30 turnovers you can't remember everyone but if you have 11 he can go and say Caleb you know those two possessions in a row in the second half not great you can do better yeah uh, so I, I think that's instructive and now they have a chance to play Marquette on Wednesday and, and really you know get some momentum going into the stretch of Florida the closing stretch of Florida State uh, Syracuse and Duke yeah, I, I love that you mentioned the the stretch of, of Caleb's turnovers because, again, he had another what felt like a good game. I mean, the whole team had 29 assists or something like that, something ridiculous. Um, and, you know, to be able to see, uh, and, and this is a very, very teachable moment, but that sequence in the second half um, where Carly Jones essentially was just sitting on his offhand. I mean, just literally sitting on his offhand waiting for him to – to make his little shift about halfway up the court and stole it from him, I think three out of four straight possessions. Uh, and it was a little helter skelter there for a little bit, but that is very much a teachable moment. Guys, I'm going to throw some stats out and, and offensively it was a night for, you know, guys like uh, Steve Kirshner and anybody in the SID department <laughs> who wants to just throw numbers out there, but uh, UNC moved up. And I think Sherelle, I think you hit this earlier. They're up to 33 in the net right now, which puts them just outside of Q1. Uh, and I know they're looking for Q1 wins, but you mentioned it. The 45-point win is the second largest in Roy Williams' uh, conference games since he's been here. Um, the first one was against another team that wears red. 136.3 uh, offensive efficiency. 
that's absurd. And, and I don't think, and I was, uh, I was briefly looking at it last night, but I don't think that UNC's hit anything like that in at least two to three seasons. Um, Sean, how do you feel like they can carry over having a game where they're just so efficient offensively? And even, even when they took bad shots, you know, you had a guy like Dayron Sharp just knifing in the air in his 260-pound frame, stealing a ball on an offensive rebound and tapping it back in. I mean, how can UNC continue that momentum with such uh, – and it doesn't have to be matching that offensive uh, efficiency, but how can they keep doing those things to keep that OE number up? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, some of the things you saw in the, in the Louisville game, uh, you know, you felt they looked a lot crisper. Um, in, t- in terms of their movements. I know this was kind of talked about on the, the message boards, but you have started to see more spacing um, between the bigs, especially when one does catch it down low. Uh, you know, it, it's once again, not a full out for, for out, but there is a lot more spacing. Um, you, you see people not getting caught up uh, in the middle of the lane as much, at least, at least lately. Um, so I think that, you know, you can definitely carry over, carry over that you know, one thing, and I'm going individual here, but RJ Davis uh, hitting two threes, I think can definitely carry over because he missed his first one. It looked good. It was kind of in and out. Uh, yeah. He, I would have to go back a few games to see when he hit his last one, but I think there was a lot of 0 for 1, 0 for 2 performances. And I think for him, just seeing the ball go in the basket uh, has to be a, a big relief. Um, so hopefully that can carry over because I definitely think we're going to need his, you know, his scoring off the bench. And, you know, once again, from a, from a big perspective, Dayron was killing it on the, on the boards um, because if he's getting fouled, he wanted him to at least make the basket because he's been, <laughs> been struggling big time, <laughs> big time from the line. Uh, but even Armando has been able to hit a few outside the paint jump shots, which once again, if he's able to do that, that kind of alleviates some of the paint congestion, um, whether it's Brooke, Sharp, Kessler, et cetera. And then finally, you know, Kessler has been getting some minutes and sure you'd love for him to go up a little quicker when he, when he catches it. And there's like that one to two seconds where you think it's an easy dunk. Uh, but at the same time, he, he, he's been gaining confidence. I think that's the biggest thing for him and for the team going forward. So I think there are, there are definite things, but at the same time, we know this is a team that once again came off beating Duke at Duke and then, won two for 16 against UVA the next game. So I think Marquette is a good opponent to hopefully continue that. But once again, they do have a lot of talent. So it wouldn't surprise me if it's more of a game than people think. Yeah. You know, Kessler's uh, efficiency, since we're talking about efficiency, Kessler's efficiency and what he's able to do in limited minutes. And even those minutes have started to grow a little bit, just when we all thought they were going to continue to shrink. Um, It's been really neat to see. And his effort is, uh, is really remarkable, especially when you think of somebody his size. You know, he's a gazelle on ice skates out there or a giraffe on ice skates out there diving all over the floor. And, and yeah, I think we should coin his nickname right now on this podcast uh, as as the raspberry because the guy's just always on the floor, especially – seems like he's always diving right in front of the UNC bench too, so I don't know if he's just trying to get some points <laughs> with the staff. But um, love to see that energy out of a kid that big that's willing to throw his body on the floor. Sherelle? Something else that we saw last night, and you finally put it to paper uh, with uh, with your projection that you said here many weeks ago and, and bore it out through some research that Kerwin Walton is absolutely going to own every offensive uh, shooting record with regard to perimeter shots at North Carolina if he stays all four years and stays healthy. Once again, last night, you know, a very, uh, very pedestrian evening for Mr. Walton, 23 minutes, seven for 10 from the field five of seven for three had one really nice up and under that he drove for a layup uh total points were 19 is is Kerwin Walton continuing to be sneaky good or is he actually at some point are people going to start respecting him oh no I mean he's he's past sneaky good now I mean he is an anomaly I mean because freshmen I mean I I don't know how many times we've said it freshmen don't shoot well by and large there are, yeah, there's, there's 35 years of, of precedent on that, that freshmen just don't shoot well, particularly at North Carolina. And Kerwin has come in and, um, you know, the question was never if he was going to be a good enough shooter. That was never a question. I think everyone who watched him, Sean studied him, did, you know, articles on him and everything, knew that he'd be a good shooter. 
probably not in year one because we didn't think you'd be able to get on the court because of some other deficiencies. But what has um, proven to be true is that um, the difference between him and other players on the court who maybe are better defensively, <clears throat> the difference between his shooting and their shooting is so astronomically high that he has to be on the court as much as possible and he has to shoot as much as possible. There's a story. Uh, I talked to uh, Cam Johnson's dad, Gilbert Johnson, a lot. And he always talks about how um, Cam was such a high efficiency player and that, you know, the coaching staff and, and Gilbert and pretty much everyone around Cameron was like, you have got to shoot more. Anytime you shoot it, it's, it's not enough. Like you need to shoot 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 times a game. Dewey talked about it a lot on post game podcast uh, a couple of years ago. Just, you know, you're that good of a shooter, shoot it as much as possible. And I think we're there with Carmen Walton now. Like I think he took seven threes. You know, would anybody have been upset if he took 11? Because the odds know. are, the odds are he's going to make two of those. So um, as many shots as he can handle, you know, I think he should take. And it, it's so opened up North Carolina's offense. It's, it's incredible what's happened, you know, since he's been inserted into the starting lineup. I think that actually would be a good story for someone to do um, since he's been inserted over the last 11 games, kind of the changes in UNC's offense, not just from – a scoring standpoint, but from an efficiency standpoint and a three point shooting standpoint. So there's, um, you know, that part of it, I think is phenomenal. And then, yeah, um, him becoming what he is already. Again, it just, it gives you another player to bank on in the future. We talked about how UNC is trying to build two teams at once, essentially, yeah. because there are going to be some players who leave after this season, but you would expect Walton to be back. And if he is already at this level improvement from him and plus improvement from other folks and he clears everything's out for, for other players, it just makes North Carolina, you know, that much better of a team. So I, you know, I, I think you can't talk enough about how much of an impact he's made on, on UNC this season. And I personally really appreciate him for playing so well in between the stories, you know, the story that we wrote. So like yeah. he was really good against <laughs> Northeastern and he was really good against Louisville and the story came out on Friday. So it was like, or Thursday, so it was perfect. Um, so really appreciate that from him. Good time. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then the, the other thing I wanted to switch to Joey talking about, um, uh, you know, UNC's offense, you know, before the season, we talked about our fans really going to matter is home court really going to matter, et cetera, et cetera. We didn't think so. But Roy Williams has talked about it, and Greg has written Greg Barnes has written stories about it, and it's really rung true. Like, look at North Carolina's offense at home, and I can tell you all the numbers since they've only played a few home games: seventy nine points in a win, uh, then seventy three points in a win, sixty six against Notre Dame was a season low in a win. Then they had eighty one against Syracuse, eighty against Wake Forest, eighty six against NC State, ninety one at Duke, and then eighty two at home against Northeastern, and ninety nine against Louisville. So there is something to be said about shooting in rims in which you're comfortable about being in familiar settings. I didn't think it would be so pronounced this year, but, but it has been. And you can see it in North Carolina's offense by just looking at the numbers. Yeah, man, that recliner in your own house is always going to be more comfortable <laughs> than the one at somebody else's. I mean, just, yeah. you, you can't argue that. I love what you said about Kerwin, too, getting a higher volume of shots. Uh, Tommy, and Ashley, Tommy Ashley and I on the Inside Carolina Live radio show yesterday at 10 a.m., on WCHL or at Chapelboro.com. I plug, missed it. Um, we had Brandon Robinson on, and we talked to B-Rob and said, you know, B-Rob's game was all – he played the same position. His game was all predicated on on outside shots. And he might have been a little more athletic than than Kerwin was when he left, but there was some similarities to he and Kerwin's game when they both got to UNC. And he said the exact same thing, that, you know, I want him to shoot more. And I'm quoting Brandon there. But, uh, I mean, it's – he wants to see Kerwin Walton shoot more too because, like – you just said and like sean said before and like a lot of fans are starting to see you feel like it's going in when he pulls the trigger so i don't think more shots for him would be a bad thing um guys i'll give you each one more stab at something you want to mention about this game before we move on to previewing marquette and then uh and then putting a bow on this episode sean anything else you want to call to about the uh, the absolute offensive explosion against louisville uh i guess i'll stay on on kerwin i, I mean i think well, two things on Kerwin. One, you kind of saw when he did hit those two threes when UNC was making the run, everybody was trying to find him for that heat check shot. Um, and that yeah. was probably one of the few ones where, you know, he probably shot it a, a little quick. But at that point, everybody was trying to get, you know, they knew he burn was it down. and <laughs> yeah, burn, burn it down is right. But really, one of the things that stood out to me in the first half was he got isolated on Williamson, um, I, I believe, on the right wing. And once again, Williamson didn't have a great year as a freshman, but he was still a top 30 guy 
coming out of coming out of high school and here's this guy trying to take Walton off the dribble which was his biggest weakness and you know why a lot of people myself didn't think he would get the time he's getting and Walton was able to stay with him and really and basically force a turnover uh which I you know was was super impressive so you know the overall everything that he's doing has been been great and and you know hopefully continues to perform because if you get you know, those like two threes in a row, six points so quick, it just makes the game so much easier, uh, especially with, with UNC style of play. Yeah, great call out on his defensive improvement. I've also noticed that his lateral quickness has improved. Uh, I think that's probably just a, attributing that to, to Jonas Serration and the strength staff. Would love to see how much more that can get, uh, how much more that can improve uh, through an off season. Cheryl, anything else you want to say about the Louisville game? Yeah, two things. Uh, one is about Kerwin again. Uh, I think it was really good <laughs> to what he's able, what he's able to learn. I, I think it shows how he's processing the game. Mm-hmm. Um, we want him to shoot more, uh, but there were times where he could have forced a three, but instead he just made a quick little pump fake or, or, you know, a hesitation and went right by the defender. One was for an easy scoop layup, I think in the second half. And another one was for uh, kind of a bank, you know, eight foot jump shot in, in the lane in the first half. Um, so just, he, na- he now knows that, oh, okay, they're going to run out at me no matter what. So I can just take a couple of steps and have a layup. Um, just that, that, that mental, um, those mental reps that he has of that already is huge. And I think people need to realize, you know, just how fast he's processing things because he's already changing his game. Um, you know, he's already has a counter to what some of the defenses are throwing at him. And then the other thing, and I'll be brief, I, I tweeted this, so I don't want to make it seem like it's an original thought, you know, that I haven't already shared, but uh, I thought Walker Kessler, his minutes are very, very important for the future of North Carolina yeah. for a variety of reasons, um, you know, um, and, and so it's been good to see him engaged and confident. He went from playing basically none to playing a decent amount. And you see him getting better as he's able to play more minutes. So I think it's important. We talked about it a few weeks ago, like, should they keep kind of force feeding him minutes? And uh, I said, yes, because they're going to need him. And I think, you know, you're starting to see some of the, f- the fruit of, of those seeds um, a few weeks later. <clears throat> but there was one possession in the second half. The biggest question me, I think Sean and others had about him was, OK, what is he going to do when you put him in a pick and roll in, in a ball screen? How is he going to defend? And it's still a work in progress, but I think it was important against David Johnson. He got switched off onto him and Johnson put a few moves on him, a crossover, a, a hesitation. And if you just watch Walker's feet, you go back to about the 903 mark of the second half, the way his feet moved, I, I didn't know they could move like that. <laughs> and he forced Johnson to go right. Johnson threw up a really bad shot and off Carolina was to the other end. Um, so like, you know, a really small play, but I, I think, um, like I tweeted, a really important one for UNC because he doesn't have to do it the entire game. But if he can do that a few possessions a game and just force bad shots from guards, that really helps North Carolina this year and moving forward. Yeah, I mean, just reducing himself as a liability or reducing how much of a liability that he is. That's yeah, that's a great point. Uh, I'll t- I change I changed my mind. I'm going to ask one more thing that I feel like I picked up on last night. Uh, tell me if I'm wrong, but I feel like UNC used a pick and roll more last night than I've ever seen them. And maybe that's a recency bias in me saying that, but I, maybe they were looking for it more from something they saw in the scouting report, or it was just something that they worked into to trying to exploit Louisville. Uh, Sean, Sherelle, did I, did I see more pick and roll last night or, or am I seeing things? It seemed, it seemed like it, but I don't know if it's because they were successful pick and rolls and we just kind of ignore <laughs> the ones that aren't successful. Uh, but it, 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 it did seem like, you know, there was a, a concerted effort. I, I'm not an expert by any means, but it seemed like it. Sean? Yeah, I mean, it will be interesting, you know, with, whether Adrian has something or, or we, we get some numbers on that, but I, it did seem like that, but it also seemed like UNC was setting better screens, actually hitting – hitting the defender. And then there is kind of, once again, going back to the crisp ball movement that you were able to kind of, once the guard turned the corner or something was happening, whether they're putting pressure on the defense or, you know, throwing a good pass. So I think that's also been missing uh, previously was, was just some of the crispness where, you know, there might be a pick and roll, but it doesn't really do anything. And then, you know, you're not really putting any, any pressure on the defense. So you know, once again, Chris ball movement and moving with a purpose is, is hopefully we can something we can see over the next four games. Awesome. I uh, appreciate you making me not feel like an idiot for that. Cause I, I would have felt really bad if both of you guys told me I was full of it. Um, all right. <laughs> now let's, let's move on to the game in the middle of the week this week, 
Uh, UNC has just added Marquette coming down from Miliwake, which is Algonquin for Crooked Water. Um, I'll be coming down with uh, Rails boy Steve Wojciechowski at the helm. <laughs> Guys, I'll be honest, I've seen nothing about Marquette <laughs> this year um, other than – they had two guys that were on their team last year that are now at Michigan and Virginia or Michigan state and Virginia respectively. Uh, Shrill, what can you tell our listeners and our viewers and your host about, uh, about Marquette and what we can expect to see Wednesday. About the team in general, not a ton. Um, I'm taking this from Brian Ives, but they are kind of similar, similarly ranked um, in Kim Palm and various metrics to NC state. Um, you know, obviously I, they play a different style, but that's kind of where they are. So that if that helps you, uh, understand what type of team they are you know they are in, in that realm um, and then I, I know about three of their players just from recruiting circles and everything uh, DJ Carton Dawson Dawson Garcia and Justin Lewis uh, Garcia had a UNC offer and mm -hmm. you know Walker Kessler kind of took it before Garcia had a chance to uh, commit I, I think North Carolina had an excellent shot with him had uh, Walker Kessler went elsewhere so there's some familiarity there familiarity there um, Carton UNC never really recruited. He's a transfer from uh, Ohio State, but a really good player. And then Justin Lewis has been out for a little bit, but he's someone that actually I think visited Chapel Hill a few years ago. Um, so I, I didn't give you much about the actual team because honestly I don't More know. I have, but, but they do. There is some talent there and some talent that was wanted by a lot of schools on, on the roster. Man, let the floor slapping begin. Sean, what do you got for us? <laughs> uh, so. Watched a lot of Marquette earlier in the year, not, not as much lately, but they did have some big wins early in the year, beating Creighton on the road, uh, beating Wisconsin. Uh, big, big East play, six and 10 in conference. And they've lost, they've, they're basically two and six, their last eight with both of those wins coming over Butler, including the last one. Uh, you know, I think in terms of how they match up right now, it'll probably be a six ish point spread. Um, so, you know, I think once again, they have individual talent. For the most part, they haven't been able to put it together in Big East play, but you never know, you know, some teams get in the Dean Dome and they just start start cooking. Uh, DJ Carton has been a fairly inefficient, uh, poor shooting player, but he's athletic. And if he catches fire, you never know. I think uh, against Butler, they're five of 18 from, from three, but they're 24 of 27 from the line. So, uh, you know, I think a very interesting matchup offensively luckily they're not like a Clemson or UVA where they're just going to try to use 30 seconds off the shot clock which I think can really frustrate UNC in terms of how how they play um, you know they, they should up should give up some offensive rebounds but at the same time you know Theo John is a guy that just I mean that dude is he is a, a jacked <laughs> jacked a dude he is. <laughs> and Dawson Garcia is 6'11 um, so they do have have some size and they have some experience. So I think it, you know, it'll be a good, a good game. You're going to be disappointed if UNC loses, but I think it'll be a good, uh, good matchup heading into Florida state. And I think we all saw what Florida state did on Monday to UVA at home. Holy Lord. Theo John looks like he's been snatching chains since he was two. <laughs> he looks Man, like a defensive end. dude. Does he not look like a defensive end? Like God. He's, okay. Yeah. yeah. He's, yeah. Uh, he's, he's a, a large specimen of a human being. All right. Well, got that to look forward to uh, Wednesday night. Appreciate you guys calling my attention to him. Um, yeah, sorry. That's, that's live podcasting for you, everybody. Um, and then, of course, Florida State coming in to the Smith Center next Saturday. We know what to expect there. A lot of athleticism. Um, they have been more up than down. Uh, I've seen some really good things. And then they did struggle with uh, Wake Forest. But, um, yeah, just – beat the mud out of uh, out of UVA as Sean just mentioned so be a lot to watch for this week hope hopefully this team can continue to improve on the things that we've called out on this show and and hopefully next week when we get back together we'll have uh, you know we'll have some more positivity to talk about and share with the audience boys parting shots anything you want to mention before we uh before we close up for tonight Sean not not much I'm just excited to see how they you know it's going to be two games this week um so I'm excited to see where we're at Next time we record this, having faced a uh, decent Marquette team and a, probably what's the best ACC team right now in Florida That's State at one. home. So yeah, for sure. Sherelle, anything to, to throw on top of this uh, on top of the smorgasbord before we get out? Yeah, I'll just say I, I'm really interested in in the Florida State game. Uh, you know, they played three road games the entire season, and back to the point we talked about earlier, like 
you know, it is different. Um, they struggled against Pittsburgh, a, a team that Carolina, I, I think, beat pretty handily at Pittsburgh. Uh, they were, I think they were nine and a half point favorites and ended up winning by seven, but it was, it was closer. It was close to uh, the end. Yeah, it was close to the end. And other than that, they had that poor showing at Georgia Tech. Um, and then, you know, they lost at Clemson, I think, like around Christmas or something. Um, <clears throat> so we'll see what happens. You know, I, I think Carolina has a lot of confidence and they actually have the personnel in my opinion, to, to play with Florida State, the, the depth and um, the length and the athleticism. Um, obviously, Scotty Barnes was out last game, so curious to see how he fits in. Um, but they they can be Florida State. You know, it's just a matter of limiting turnovers. Um, they played really well uh, down in Tallahassee. And if they can have, I think, a similar performance, then they have an excellent chance of winning. Uh, so we'll see what happens. And, and maybe this confidence carries over into Wednesday and then to Saturday. And hey, that team that played Louisville Saturday night can beat just about anybody in the country. No, that's that's no no bias. I mean, that was an absolute buzzsaw. So we'll close this up the way we started talking about the buzzsaw that hit the Smith Center uh, Saturday night for the Tar Heels. As always, appreciate Sean Moran and Shrill McMillan stopping in and making us all smarter. Uh, I've just tried to keep us between the lines here, and we will talk to everybody next week on the Coast to Coast podcast here on InsideCarolina.com. Special thanks to John Sigley for producing and Johnny T-Shirt for sponsoring. We will talk to you guys next time. Late.